Okay, so yeah, let me start by welcoming back everybody to this uh, Economics of Migration webinar series. Thanks uh, for being back. Uh, we come back uh, really strongly with uh, Sandra Sequeira today from LSE, who is uh, uh, kind enough to present in front of us her work on forces displacement, human capital and occupational choice. I suppose that most of you have been following her work. It's uh, really good stuff on the effects of uh, immigrants and the making of uh, America. That was, I, I was struggling to remember the, the title of your paper, Sandra. And you have uh, other projects that look uh, really interesting in your portfolio, the political economy of refugee integration and immigrants in the American dream. But uh, today you are going to mark basically our first year anniversary of this uh, seminar series with this paper on forced displacement, human capital, and occupational choice. So I'll, I'll leave the virtual floor to Sandra. Thanks a lot for joining us, and please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thanks for the invitation to be here. So indeed, I'll be presenting today a project on forced displacement, human capital, and occupational choice. So this is joint work with Giorgio Chiovelli, who I think is with us and can answer some questions in the chat. Elias Papayuanu um, and Steli Michalopoulos. So we were motivated to look at the problem of forced displacement, just given how staggering the numbers are. By 2019, over 79 million people had been forcibly displaced from their homes. So this means one person being displaced every three seconds. Out of these, about 43% are crossing borders, so these will be the refugees, while the majority, about 57%, are displaced within their own countries as internally displaced individuals. Now, while most of the media attention and a lot of the public discourse have kind of revolved around the impact of refugee flows in developed countries, these are actually representing a very small fraction of total displacement flows. The key fact that is often overlooked in the media is that about 85% of the world's forcibly displaced population lives in the developing world, and out of these, about 40% are children. Now, many of those that are displaced are also in fragile states. So the UN estimates that the 36 most fragile states in the world account for only about 3% of global GDP, but they host about a third of the world's population of forcibly displaced individuals. And unfortunately, the number of refugees and IDPs in the developing world is only expected to increase with worsening conflict in several countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Today's figure, the 79 million, in fact, has doubled since 2010. And the World Bank predicts that the share of global poor who are living in fragile and conflict-affected countries is going to reach about 46% um, by 2030. Now, first displacement can obviously affect economic performance through many different channels. A key channel that we will focus on in this paper is how being forced to flee can affect one's investments in human capital, so both your incentives to do so, but also your ability to do so, and how it can then subsequently affect occupational choice. So these outcomes are obviously relevant since they're potential drivers of economic development and growth. But despite the increasing socioeconomic importance of these flows, there's still scant evidence on what the medium and long-term socioeconomic impacts of forced displacement can be, particularly in the developing world. So conceptually, we're going to start by thinking about the impact of conflict on displacement as generating one out of three possible scenarios. So people can either stay behind in their places of birth, which may be rural or maybe urban, they can become IDPs and be displaced into another rural location or to a city. And finally, they can be displaced into a neighboring country, often to refugee camps. So today, in fact, most refugees who are living in rural areas, one out of two is going to be living in a managed refugee camp. Alternatively, they can settle in informal settlements. These are usually set up or spring up close to the border, rather. Now, the literature to date has made very limited progress on this question due to three key challenges. I mean, one is just the lack of data on forced displacement. The second one is obviously selection concerns. So conflict is not random. Household or locality characteristics can drive both selection into different types of forced displacement trajectories, but it can also then drive uh, investments in human capital and occupational choice. And finally, most work to date has focused on just one type of displacement, when the reality is often much more complex with all the different 
trajectories kind of happening simultaneously. So in this paper, we're going to try to make progress on this question by first exploiting a very rich microcensus data from a protracted Mozambican civil war that took place between 1977 and 1992. It displaced about 4 million people. So it's one of the largest episodes of conflict-driven displacement in recent history. In fact, it's only comparable to the current crisis in Syria. Now, these data allow us to reconstruct displacement trajectories for over 12 million people, which is the universe of the surviving population. And we then supplement this with a survey was, that was conducted in early 2020 to examine the long-term effects of displacement. For identification, we will exploit the fact that families were very large in Mozambique, so the median number of children was about 5.7 per family. And second, that during the chaos of war, several families were kind of split in a quasi-random way. Uh, this is a very common feature of conflict settings, and so Mozambique was no exception. But what this does is, it, is that it allows us to exploit within family variation across siblings, and even more restrictively across twins, to try to control for any individual and family level characteristics that could both affect displacement trajectories, decisions about schooling, and then employment in the post-war period. And lastly, we're going to study this in a setting that is likely to best mirror most conflict scenarios today, in which the different displacement trajectories are kind of occurring all at the same time, so that we can have some comparability on their socioeconomic effects. So to start with a preview of the findings. So we find that displacement from rural areas into cities is associated with an almost 30% increase in the probability of schooling, compared to those who stayed behind in the rural place of birth. So this is an eight percentage point increase. We find that displacement into other rural areas also leads to a significant increase in schooling, though it's smaller in magnitude of about three percentage points, again, relative to non-movers who stayed in rural areas. In contrast, refugees have very similar levels of education to those who stayed behind in rural areas. Now, when we look at our second outcome, all types of displacement are associated with occupational shifts out of agriculture towards services, but this effect is much stronger for those who moved into urban areas and is driven by those who invested the most in education during the war. In terms of the mechanisms, we look at the role of individual household and destination characteristics. So first we find that some individual characteristics matter. So the effects are more pronounced for boys and they're modestly higher for firstborn as well, regardless of whether it's a boy or a girl. Another important individual level characteristic that we explored is whether a child moved with an adult or not. The majority of children in, um, in our sample do move with an older relative, so either a father or a mother or an uncle or an aunt. And, but there we find that this has no impact on schooling decisions of those displaced. We find some evidence that household characteristics also matter. So we find differences across family educational background. The investments in schooling and occupational shifts are far more pronounced for those whose parents and grandparents were more educated to begin with before the war. Um, another important proxy for the experience of the household as a whole during the war is whether the household experienced the death of an offspring. Um, we investigate that, but we don't find that it has any differential impact on schooling decisions of those displaced. And finally, we look at regional characteristics. So here we find that place also matters. So the effects are far larger for individuals who move to larger towns or to larger cities. When we look at another important regional characteristic, such as conflict intensity, here we don't find significant variation, mostly across rural areas, and potentially in part because conflict was quite widespread at the time, um, also perhaps we're measuring conflict with some degree of measurement error, so we don't find an important margin of heterogeneity here. The last characteristic that we look at is the level of mortality of offspring mortality for non-movers. So this is a, a now estimated or calculated at a region, as a regional characteristic. And here we find that it has no impact on schooling, but in areas with higher mortality, so when the displaced individual moves to an area with higher mortality, uh, that individual is less likely to leave agriculture. So that perhaps is a proxy of just poor economic conditions in general.
We then turn to the long-term effects of displacement. So here we conduct a survey in 2020 in one of the largest cities in northern Mozambique. So it's a city that doubled in size during the war to accommodate displaced individuals. And in this survey, we can confirm the findings from the analysis of the census data. So we find that displacement into cities was associated with higher investments in education. So displaced individuals invest more in education than their siblings who stayed behind and they converge to the level of education of those that were urban born. So their counterpart as an urban cohort. We also find that those who were displaced integrate fairly well into the social fabric of cities, at least measured by standard indicators of attitudes, beliefs about social norms. They're very similar in these attitudes and beliefs to those who were born in the city and who were never displaced during the war. However, the survey also reveals the potential long-term downsides of displacement. So internally displaced individuals report significantly worse mental health. They have lower levels of trust in their community, and they appear to be more pessimistic about the future relative to, again, the urban cohort that was not displaced during the war. They also report slightly lower wages on average, despite the fact that they have very similar levels of education compared to the urban cohort. So with this work, we hope to contribute to several literatures. First, we build on a literature that examines the economic impact of refugee flows. Now the literature overwhelmingly looks at resettlement into advanced economies. As I mentioned earlier, low-income countries actually receive the highest number of refugees and have the highest number of IDPs worldwide. The literature is often also focused on quite unique and special historical case studies, some of which are in non-conflict settings even, and most of them involve just one type of displacement, so usually external displacement and refugees. Well, again, contemporary forced displacement often involves all these different types of displacement that can occur at the same time. So we hope that our case study enables us to better understand the impact of all these different displacement trajectories in a bit of a more unified manner. Second, our paper is part of a broader literature that tries to quantify the impact of civil war on development. Here the evidence on the speed of post-conflict recovery is actually quite mixed. So some studies document a negative impact of conflict on schooling, while others show that schooling can actually increase in conflict-affected countries, and educational attainment can recover reasonably quickly during the post-war period. So one possible way of reconciling this mixed evidence is by accounting for forced displacement during the war. So it could be a novel mechanism of economic recovery, which is based on just the type of displacement that occurred and how that affected human capital investments that continue to occur during the war. We also contribute to a literature that just attempts to unbundle or unpack conflict by looking again at a particular understudy dimension of conflict which is displacement. Now, we hope to also contribute to a more applied practitioner literature on what is the optimal humanitarian response to conflict. So while refugee camps can provide a safe haven during periods of conflict, they can provide functioning schools, functioning clinics, they seldom provide the incentives for people to want to invest in education due to very limited employment opportunities. So managing IDP inflows in perhaps into urban areas may mitigate some of the negative effects of conflict on human capital investment, while also avoiding kind of the cross-border political, economic, and social downside that is often associated with the refugee model as well. And finally, we hope to contribute to a fast-growing literature that tries to isolate the importance of place in creating socioeconomic opportunity. So this research looks at usually internal movement in peaceful times. Here we're focusing obviously in a conflict setting, but we do confirm the results in the literature that regional childhood exposure effects can actually matter for human capital accumulation and for occupational choices later in life. But we also find evidence that family characteristics can matter and that the experience of displacement itself, at least in the context of conflict, can have a significant downside in itself. So let me give you a bit more on the context of Mozambique. So Mozambique was and continues to be a primarily agricultural economy. So even before the civil war, employment share in agriculture was about 90%. And average years of schooling were quite low at 0.5 average years of schooling 
um, across the country. Now, the Civil War was extremely brutal and it lasted between 1977 and 1992. It was waged between the government-backed Frelimo and the Rhodesian South African-backed Renamo. But it was a war that was mostly fought in the countryside. So the cities were fairly well protected, particularly the country's largest cities, the three largest cities that I will show in some maps in a couple of slides. So to better identify and understand the impact of displacement trajectories, we're going to rely on the 1997 census in Mozambique, which was the first census conducted five years after the end of the war. So what the census allows us to do is to know where people were at four key points. So where they were at birth, where they were right before the end of the war in 1992, where they resided in 1995, and then where they are in 1997 at the time of the census. So we can link place of birth, location in 92, prior to the end of the war, location in 1997, in order to try to identify conflict-driven displacement. So from the census, we get information on the family structure, educational attainment of each individual, and sector of employment in 1997. It also gives us some individual and household level characteristics, such as gender, age, household level, offspring mortality, et cetera. When we try to get information on development indicators at the locality level, we manage to obtain information on railroad and trail networks, so transport infrastructure. We digitize and geocoded all the data from prior to the Civil War. We also use data on the location of landmines across Mozambique. So this was painstakingly done by my co-authors, in fact, in previous work. We have information on what are called colonial cantinas. So these were kind of colonial trading hubs. So we have information on where they were located. And then we collect primary data on conflict events. So here what we do is we expand the ACLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. We expand their data set for Mozambique using a similar methodology and based on the usual sources from news cables, secondary literature, and newspaper articles. And finally, we conduct a field survey in one of Mozambique's largest cities to try to understand the long-term effects of displacement into cities. So starting with a breakdown for the full census and the different types of displacement trajectories that we can observe. So most of the results that I'm going to present today are for the sample on the right-hand side. So the sample for 12 to 32 year olds in 1997. And the goal of doing this is that then we can cover individuals who were of primary school going age during the conflict. So we can observe individuals who made their schooling decisions during the war. So we can see here that about 65% of the population did not move. So these were the non-movers who remained mostly in rural areas. About 8% of the population was displaced into neighboring countries, mostly into refugee camps. And about 27% of the population was internally displaced. In fact, these proportions are, are quite similar to what we observe in other conflict settings, um, such as, in, again, in Syria today. Now, because displacement took all these different forms, just to fix ideas, I'll briefly summarize kind of the main features of each type of displacement. So starting with external displacement. So here the map to the left shows the distribution of localities of origin of those who were displaced into neighboring countries. So the refugee camps are here represented by stars. So we have in Malawi and Zimbabwe in South Africa, the majority of the camps were in fact in Malawi. There are about 18 of them in total. The map on the right shows the people's location. So those who were externally displaced and then returned to Mozambique and where they resettled into in 1997. So it is clear from this heat map that shows that these warmer colors are where you have a higher share of externally displaced, is that most of those who were externally displaced actually were living closer to the border and then that they returned to similar areas. So the majority of refugees fled into Malawi. Um, Renamu's base was concentrated in central Mozambique. But then as the war spread, about 40,000 Mozambicans actually also fled to Tanzania, to Zambia, to Swaziland, to South Africa. Now, it's important to note that the census does not exactly identify the external refugee camp to which each individual might have gone. So all we know is where individuals were during the war and whether they were abroad. 
Um, but when we compare the aggregate country figures that people report being in, so either South Africa, Malawi, or Zimbabwe, and we compare that to the archival data from the UN's refugee agency, so UNHCR, that has aggregate numbers for the number of Mozambicans who were in each of these countries, they broadly coincide, which is quite reassuring. Now, when we think about these refugee camps, we think about them as resembling rural settings in many important ways. So there were schools that were set up, the emphasis was put on primary education in particular. So the UN agencies also funded some schools that were already functioning in the areas that had a large number of settled Mozambicans. Refugees did not have the legal right to work in the host country, but they were given free food and other necessities, so they remained largely dependent on foreign aid. So there were very limited employment opportunities, and the vast majority of refugees did not have access to land in the camps. Historical narratives and reports then tend to emphasize what were the, the challenging conditions in refugee camps. So accounts of life in the camp just highlighted the challenge of idleness that resulted in general apathy, excessive drinking, and a graduate reduction in motivation to seek change. Importantly, several historical accounts also note that there was a whole generation of children who were growing up in the camps with no real heritage, no tradition, and no skill. In fact, in Malawi, which is one of the largest recipients of refugee flows, given the location of the camps very close to the border, there were some refugees who would often go back and forth to still try to till their land during the agricultural season in Mozambique. So pretty much the way we think about it is that this attachment to land into a rural way of life was still very strong. So to be a bit more concrete here is a visual illustration of what a refugee camp in Malawi during the war uh, looked like. So it resembled in every way a rural setting. In fact, it also resembles even other refugee camps in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world today. So here are some examples in the top row from Tanzania, South Sudan, on the bottom row from Guinea and Nepal as well. So for the second displacement trajectory, we're going to look at internally displaced individuals. So here, as I mentioned earlier- Sorry, Sandra, yes. uh, just to make sure I understood this correctly. Yeah. So in, the, in, the, in terms of the first trajectory, you see people who were in a camp and then came back to take the 1997 census in Mozambique. Then the, the other two trajectories I would worry about, and I would like to know how relevant they are numerically, is people who never come back, if you have it from other sources, and people who die. Right, so, so that's a great question. So on the deaths, we don't have that information. So we have in 1997, just a universe of surviving population. So think of it as we know the people who survived and are now reunited in 1997. We know where they were throughout the war and that's the comparison that we can do. Now, the other point on whether people returned or not, um, I have a graph that will break it down across the different displacement trajectories. And I think that's an important source of heterogeneity for us to, to look at as well. And so uh, hopefully I'll have time to look at that too in a couple of slides. Okay, thank you. So for the internally displaced, approximately 27% of the Mozambican population, so this is more than 3 million people, were IDPs. Out of these, about 66% went into urban areas and 34% went to, into other rural areas. Those who moved into urban areas were mostly in the top three cities. So we have here Maputo, Beira, and Nampula. Here we have the maps for those who were born in a rural area, but who were displaced into an urban area. And the map here also identifies the 12 largest uh, towns and cities in Mozambique. And again, the largest ones are going to be Nampula, Beira, and Maputo in southern Mozambique. So again, not surprisingly, what we find is that the movement to cities occurred mostly for those who were also closer to cities to begin with. When we look at those who were born in rural areas and who moved to other rural areas, then the, the movement is much more widespread, as we can see here in these figures. Then one last type of trajectory that we identified is that about 12,000 individuals, so a much smaller share of those forcibly displaced during the war, also went from urban places to the countryside during this period. And this was due to a villagization scheme that the Frelimo-backed um, government was pushing urban dwellers into communal villages in an attempt to populate uh, rural areas that could otherwise fall under Hanamu 
control. Now, historical accounts suggest that Frelimo built infrastructure, so built uh, schools, built clinics to try to attract people to the countryside and to retain them there. Most of the historical accounts and what we can observe in the census data is that in fact, these movements were permanent. So and this is one of the subgroups where there was very few people actually return to their place of birth. Now, the important question that Jesus was asking is about post-war trajectories. And so here we can see on the left-hand side, those who were born in a rural area and who were displaced. And on the right-hand side, those who were born on an urban area and who were displaced during the war. And in blue, we have those who stayed in their new destination. And in orange, um, the two shades of orange, um, right, sorry, the, the orange, the lighter orange and the gray are people who ended up in a third kind of rural or urban area. So not their initial point of displacement, but importantly for those who returned home, those are marked here by the darker or orange bars. So what we're going to see is as I present the results is how our outcomes of interest actually vary depending on whether an individual returned to their place of birth after the war or not. So we'll begin by examining some correlational evidence that is trying to link different displacement trajectories to investments in education and sexual employment in the full sample of individuals. Again, all the individuals that are aged between 12 and 32 in the 1997 census, as these are the ones who made their schooling decisions during the war. Because of considerable differences between kind of rural areas and urban areas at birth, we're going to, to separate the analysis. So we have the left-hand side here in the graph is going to look at those who were rural born. And on the right-hand side, we have those who were urban born. And our first outcome of interest is a binary indicator reflecting whether an individual completed the first year of primary school. On the left-hand side, the omitted category is going to be, or the comparison is going to be with non-movers in rural areas. So those who were born in a rural area and did not move um, throughout this entire period. And on the right panel, we have um, as the omitted category, the non-movers in urban areas. We include a host of controls, individual level characteristics that could be correlated with schooling and employment, such as age, gender, whether the child is a firstborn or not. We also include locality of birth fixed effects to try to absorb differences in socioeconomic environments at birth, or perhaps differences related to the intensity of conflict in the place of birth as well. But what we can see here in the graph is that the move looking at the left-hand side now, that the move from a rural to an urban locality during the war is associated with a very significant increase. So almost 30% increase relative to the mean of uh, investments in schooling for rural non-movers. Okay? So this is in the probability of acquiring any schooling. The effect of external displacement, as we can see, is close to zero. And in fact, this effect will even disappear as we move closer to, to causal estimates in the next couple of slides. When we look at those in urban areas, so on the right-hand side of the graph, we see that those who move to another urban area, and mostly this was a movement from a smaller town to a larger city, that they experienced an increase in the probability of schooling, obviously much smaller than what we observed for the rural to urban, since they were already coming from an urban area. Um, and then we find here in the yellow bar that those that moved from an urban area to a rural area under the government's villagization scheme experienced a significant drop in the probability of schooling. When we look at uh, different variables such as years of schooling as an outcomes with a Poisson or negative binomial, the, the results and the magnitudes are actually quite similar. Then we focus on our second outcome of interest. So occupational choice in the post-war period, so in 1997. And here we want to explore whether the, the different displacement paths actually correlate with a shift out of agriculture towards services, again, for individuals in 1997. But here we restrict the sample a bit more so that we only look at individuals who are between 16 and 32, since those are the ones who are most likely to be in the workforce in 1997. We first look at, again, at those that are born in a rural location. So this would be the graph on the left. And uh, we see that there's a big drop in the probability of being employed in agriculture. That's, that would be the blue bar. So a significant drop in the probability of being in agriculture. We see that there's a slightly smaller drop 
for those who move from a rural to rural area, but it's still significant. And we observe a very, very small drop for those who were externally displaced for refugees. And this could be in part because there's some partial loss of, of land, but the result is, is still not very sizable. On the right-hand side, we can observe uh, the impact on the probability of being in agriculture for those who move from an urban to an urban setting. So again, here the effect is quite small, but it's quite large and substantial for those who were forced under the villagization scheme to move to rural areas. So this is just a flip side of what we just saw in agriculture. So people are clearly moving out of agriculture and moving into services. So we see that particularly for those in the blue bar that went from a rural area into an urban area, experience a significant increase in the probability of being employed in services in 1997. And again, the biggest drop in this probability happens for those who were forced from the urban areas into rural areas. So that would be the yellow bar at the far left, right. So just to summarize the correlation evidence so far. So it seems like those that were externally displaced invested just as much in schooling as those who stayed behind in a rural place of birth. Though the probability of employment in agriculture drops slightly for this group, again, potentially because there's some loss of land that occurs due to displacement and during the war. The IDPs who went from rural areas into urban areas are the ones who experienced the highest increase in investments in schooling and the largest occupational shift in services. Those that went from rural areas into other rural areas are more likely to invest in schooling, but they experience a smaller shift towards services. And finally, we see those moving from urban areas to rural areas that they decrease their schooling investments and are more likely to be in agriculture. Again, this is the result of the villagization um, scheme. Now, there are a couple of additional findings that I wanted to highlight at this point. So there was some heterogeneity in the form of the external displacement. So in Zimbabwe, refugees were mostly in refugee camps, whereas in Malawi, it was a mix or a combination of refugee camps and informal settlements. And then in other countries like Zambia, Tanzania, and Swaziland, refugees were mostly absorbed into existing small local communities. But importantly, despite this heterogeneity across countries, we actually don't find significant differences on the effect of external displacement on schooling across all these different settings. The second point relates to post-war trajectory. So while the effects are positive and sizable for both those who stayed in their host destination and those who returned home following the war, they're still relatively larger for those who decided to stay. Uh, so that's something we can see here in the graph. So this goes back to Jesus' question is that we see that the effect on the stayers, which here we identify as not being returnees, is much larger than the effect on those who return. But again, the important point is that there is still a sizable and positive effect in terms of investments in schooling for both groups. And finally, perhaps reassuringly, we also find that the occupational shifts occur mostly for those who acquired an education during the war, suggesting that it's these investments in human capital that can be an important mechanism to trigger these occupational shifts. Now, the fact that we include locality of birth fixed effect in our full census analysis uh, with the results that I just showed you, that already accounts for differences in schools, population density, infrastructure, violence, and other unobserved features of localities in Mozambique. There's also the case that, like all conflicts, the Mozambican Civil War had many largely unanticipated and exogenous characteristics, at least from the viewpoint of a civilian. There were landmines, there was limited transport infrastructure. All the main players from Hanamu to Frelimo and neighboring countries had very volatile strategies during the war, but it's still possible that for some individuals, certain parental and household characteristics could have jointly impacted the displacement trajectory of each individual and subsequently investments in education and employment options as well. So what we're going to try to do now to advance on identification and improve our identification is again, relying on this well-documented fact that in conflict scenarios, more broadly, so even today, during the chaos and the uncertainty associated with conflict, the families that have a lot of offspring are often split. So leading siblings to have very different displacement experiences. So what we're going to do 
is to try to compare siblings of, uh, start with a comparison of siblings, then move to a comparison of siblings of similar age and similar gender, and even more restrictively to look at twins who followed different trajectories during the war. And doing so can it allow us to account not just for regional features at the local level, so where the household resides, but also to account for family features such as family size, motivation to educate their offspring, perhaps connections that people might have either in rural areas or in cities, which can all jointly affect both displacement trajectories and then human capital investments. Our second approach is to follow a distance-based design. So what we're going to do is to identify what we call buffer areas of transport cost equivalence in which individuals should have been indifferent between moving to a refugee camp or to a city. So one point that I wanted to, to emphasize, and I think Jesus already raised this with his question, is that we're going to focus on the universe of families that were together prior to the war, they then followed different trajectories, and then they were all reunited in 1997, and therefore are captured in our 1997 census as living together. So this is an important feature. Okay, so we identify over 120,000 households that were separated during the war. Each household has uh, different combinations of non-movers in urban and rural areas and movers to other rural and other urban areas. The majority of households in these split households have at least one sibling um, that left the household, so about 85% of them. Importantly, we have almost about 14,000 households that all the different offsprings have a combination of at least three different displacement trajectories. And we have almost a thousand households with a combination of four or more displacement trajectories. So this allows us to, to really compare within household when siblings go into different trajectories. So similar to the full census analysis, uh, and here we should focus perhaps on the most restrictive sample, which would be column four. Compared to non-movers, we find that individuals that were displaced into urban areas were more likely to complete at least one year of primary education by approximately eight percentage points. So this represents a 44% increase over the non-mover mean, which is the omitted category here. Now displacement to other rural areas also correlates with increased schooling, but the estimate is less than half the size. So again, this is consistent with what we saw in the full census. And again, this is again stable to the inclusion of family fixed effects. When we interact in this column four, we interact family fixed effects with the siblings being of similar age, so using five-year age groups, and even being of the similar gender. More restrictively in column six, we can look at the sample of twins alone. And here again, the results are similar, broadly similar. We then turn to the urban born. And so when we look at the urban born, the effects are again consistent with what we found in the full census analysis. So we find that there's a decrease in schooling for those who move from urban to rural areas. So this is again, triggered by the forced villagization scheme. For those that go from a smaller town into a larger city, they experience a bit of a bump in terms of their investments in schooling. Uh, again, this is consistent in the twin sample. When we look at our second outcome of interest, so the probability of being employed in agriculture, focusing again on column four, that includes all the fixed effects and the interactions with age and gender, we find results that are very consistent with what we found in the full sample, in the full sample as well. So we find that there's a decrease in the probability of being employed in agriculture in 1997, and this is more pronounced for those that moved from a rural area into an urban area. Similarly to those who were urban born, we find here a, also a slight decrease in the probability of being employed in agriculture, though here the samples are, are very small and so they're far more imprecise. So to summarize, what we find is consistent with the census analysis that compared to a rural non-mover, the impact of displacement on an externally displaced individual, so a refugee, means that 
it doesn't have much of an impact on schooling, so schooling is quite equivalent to staying behind. We observe a slight decline in the probability of agricultural employment. The largest effects are for those who move from a rural area into an urban area. They are more likely to invest in schooling and to move out of agriculture into services. For rural born that go into other rural areas, they also invest more in schooling, but the effect is much smaller. And again, they have also a smaller significant shift out of agriculture into services. And lastly, the effect of the villagization scheme for those who are urban born and who are pushed into the countryside. We also can May I ask you questions, yeah. Mira? Please. Yes, there is something that, that I don't uh, quite understand. Those who are externally uh, displaced, you can only observe those who came back, right? So that's right. Is it possible that those who, that those who stayed in Malawi or other countries, they had some specific characteristics and this may also uh, influence your results? Or? Yes, that's a great question. So we observed that for those who were externally displaced, about 85% of them returned to Mozambique. In fact, the UN set up one of the largest repatriation programs right after 1992 at the end of the war. It moved back about 2 million people in just a couple of years. So by 1994, the majority of people who had been externally displaced were moved back into Mozambique, which also helps us here in, in this comparison. There are going to be 15% that yes, those uh, are likely to have just stayed. And so those are not covered in our sample. So depending on when we, whether we think those are positively or negatively selected, how their outcomes might have differed from what we observe in our sample. So okay, we, thank you. Thanks. So we confirmed also the additional results that we observe in the full census, suggesting that there are larger effects for those who stayed in their host localities, those who moved to larger cities, and again, larger occupational shifts for those who acquired an education, suggesting that this is one of the mechanisms that triggers that occupational shift. Now, our second identification approach based on distance Sorry. over this, I won't show results, but I'll just explain that here, what we do in identifying these buffer areas is to find areas that are equidistant to the cities and to refugee camps as well. And we identify these buffer areas as having one quarter of the distance between the cities and the refugee camps and then we intersect our two identification strategies. So we look at the sample of siblings, so within family variation, in these buffer areas where presumably from a, a transport cost perspective, people should be indifferent between going to a refugee camp or to a city. And again, the results are quite stable. So I'll very quickly, since I've summarized this already in the beginning, mentioned individual characteristics. So we find that the effects are more pronounced for males. Uh, we don't find much of a difference on those that moved with an adult relative to children who went on their own. Um, when we look at household characteristics, we find that the results are far stronger for those who come from families with educated parents or grandparents but that the results don't differ so much depending on the, the experience that the household had during the war and whether, for instance, it had a deceased offspring or not. When we look at locality characteristics, again, just to reinforce this point that we observe that the largest effects are for those who move to the, either the largest towns or even to the largest cities in the country. We don't find, find much on conflict. This would be here on the right-hand side. I would just emphasize that in part, perhaps because conflict is, is quite widespread across rural areas in particular in Mozambique. And so we don't find conflict as being an important driver of people's schooling decisions or employment decisions overall. Great, so this will take me to the long-term effects of displacement. So we conducted a survey in 2020 to try to capture these long-term effects. It was a survey that we, implemented in Ampulu, which is one of the, the, the largest cities in Mozambique. We identified individuals who were older than 35 and therefore uh, who had made schooling decisions during the war as well. This is a, a large city that actually doubled its population during the war. So um, mostly due to the, the displacement from rural areas into urban areas. And when we look at just the general descriptive statistics of our sample, it's quite reassuring that we find that it's very comparable to the results that we found in the census as well. So uh, we confirm that those who move to Nampula have similar levels of education relative to the non-mover city dwellers who were born and raised in the city. 
we also find that a very a higher share of movers believe that some education was critical to find a job in Ampula, both during and after the war, when compared to the non-movers. And our first results when looking at the survey is that those who moved to Nampula during the war invested more in education when compared to their siblings who stayed behind in the countryside. Interestingly, almost half of the movers reported receiving advice on schooling and employment from extended family who lived in the city, which suggests that displacement amongst many things might have disrupted the intergenerational transmission of low human capital that can occur primarily in the nuclear family. We also see that movers invest just as much in education as its urban cohort, so they converge to the levels of schooling of the urban cohort who was not displaced during the war. But then to better understand the full extent to which displacement can affect socioeconomic outcomes in the long run, we examined whether those displaced were able to socially and economically integrate into the city. For economic integration, despite similar levels of education, those who moved into Nampula report on average lower levels of wages, both female and male, relative to non-mover males, which suggests that economic integration, if anything, was only partial. So this is despite having similar levels of schooling. We then investigate whether IDPs managed to integrate into the city socially, comparing responses to questions about social norms, beliefs about justice and tradition, civic responsibility and moral views. And what we find across the board is that movers report very similar attitudes and beliefs about social norms when compared to non-movers, again, suggesting social integration. But the results are quite different when we explore the potential long-term psychological effect of displacement through questions about mental health, community trust, and optimism. So for mental health here, we rely on the standard and validated measures of clinical depression following the administration of, of a standard PHQ-9 module, which is used in clinical settings to identify clinical depression. And what we find here is that movers report on average significantly worse levels of mental health. Um, when we look at trust, we find a similar result. So trust in, in terms of feelings of belonging to the neighborhood, trusting your neighbors. Again, they're less likely to be trusting of neighbors when compared to non-movers. And finally, optimism is a simple question on whether children, they believe their children will be richer than they are. And here again, we find that movers tend to be less optimistic than non-movers. So to sum up, we find that displacement trajectories matter. So there are large systematic and differences in both schooling and employment outcomes. There's a sizable impact for rural urban. So if you move from a rural area into an urban area, you invest much significantly more in schooling and are more likely to move into services in the post-war period. We see some impact for rural, but we find no impact for external displacement. So overall, this suggests that place, household, and individual characteristics also matter in driving schooling decisions. So depending on the combination of all these different characteristics of where you go to, the household characteristics and the individual characteristics, you may end up with very different levels of schooling and different occupations in the post-war period. And so our main conclusion is that forced displacement can actually represent an important mobility shock that can trigger higher investments in education, can lead to significant occupational shifts which can then eventually lead to structural transformation in the places where these individuals are uh, displaced to. So what this suggests is that we should think about improving strategies to better manage and kind of leverage displacement flows during conflict to try to channel displaced individuals into perhaps more urban environments where they have more economic opportunities and to move slightly away from uh, the refugee camp model. Of course, our, our findings still suggest that forced displacement can have significant hidden costs and have long-term uh, implications on earnings and negatively impact um, mental health as well. So strategies that attempt to address this could also maximize the potential benefits of displacement for economic development and growth. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sandra. Uh, I've seen that Giorgio had uh, his hands full during the presentation in the chat and in, in the Q&A section, but there are still several open questions that he couldn't get to. So unless there are some urgent questions from the panelists, 
maybe I will first uh, give the floor to, let me see who didn't, uh, who, uh, Patricia, do you want to go ahead and ask your question directly to Sandra? Yes, one sec. Yeah. Hi, Sandra, how are you? Uh, no, I was just curious of, uh, like you've mentioned some of the possible mechanisms of the higher like educational attainment by those that go to rural, like coming from information or higher returns to their education. But I was wondering about potential differential effect of the conflict kind of, of school functioning you know, or school availability, like more from the supply side of schooling that might have been different in the rural versus the urban areas. Right, and I think that's absolutely one of the challenge of the channel. So it's something that we cannot, unfortunately, we cannot isolate because the move to the city means moving to an area that is safer, an area with a thicker labor market, an area with perhaps better and more functional schools as well. So I think that that's definitely a mechanism. We do have some information on school availability in rural areas. So whether the school exists or not. So we don't have a perfect measure as to whether it's functional during this period. But when we use this course measure of whether a school exists in a rural area or not, we do find some heterogeneous effects. So if you move from a rural area to another rural area that is more likely to have a school, then you're more likely to invest in education as well. So I think that's definitely an important channel too. Thank you. Okay, so I, I see an, an interesting question from uh, Giacomo in the Q&A. So Giacomo, do you want to go ahead and ask your, your question live? Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is partially related to Patricia's question. And so it, it relates to, um, to actual engagement in conflict activities. Do you get a sense? So this relates to the uh, mechanism that, uh, uh, that uh, drive your result. And uh, I'm wondering whether you know whether there's a differential probability of engaging in conflict activities for those who stay compared to those who actually go to other areas, be it rural, rural or urban. So the question is, do we, do we have to assume that um, the uh, people in your sample uh, did not engage in conflict at all? And if not, whether this could uh, explain some, some results? Right, uh, that's a great question as well. So again, unfortunately we don't have the right type of data that would allow us to convincingly answer that question. So we tried very hard to get good data on conflict using many different measures, as I mentioned, of news cables, secondary literature, following the ACLED methodology. And there we don't find significant uh, heterogeneity across regions. So if you're in an area that has registered more conflict, that that doesn't necessarily um, have an impact on, on schooling decisions. So that's one of the graphs that I showed earlier. We've also tried different measures of whether, how far these areas were from Renamu headquarters or whether they were occupied by Renamu at some point during the war. And again, we failed to find some results. So, so I think with conflict, again, it's either because it was very widespread, there was a lot of uncertainty overall, and, uh, and so that's perhaps why we don't pick up significant heterogeneity. So that's one aspect. The other aspect that you ask about is, will the non-movers, are they more likely to engage directly in conflict? Now, that's certainly a possibility. When we do the within-family comparison, we're comparing siblings who stayed behind to siblings who were displaced. And again, when we see that those who are displaced invest less in or have a lower probability of being in agriculture, that means presumably that those who stayed behind uh, had land and that they stayed in agriculture. So what we're assuming is that they mostly stayed in agriculture, but of course that's something that we cannot perfectly observe. So whether there was direct involvement in, in conflict activities or not. Thank you. Okay, so we have another couple of questions. So first, uh, Simone and then uh, Martin. Yeah. Simone, please go ahead. Thanks, Jesus. So Sandra, correct me if I'm wrong. Your household fixed effect are defined in 1997, right? So you look at household composition in 1987 at the time of the census. So my concern is that for siblings and for, for twins as well, you, you are only able to identify them as such if they coincide after the war. So my, the question that I had in my mind is to what extent should we be concerned that the, the likelihood of coinciding together with a mm -hmm. twin or with your own siblings in 1997 depends on 
the different trajectories and and possibly even on on your outcomes right that's a very important point and that was something that worried us as well i mean is this sample skewed in any way because people are still at 32 or still living with the household so the best we can do there is to restrict our sample to a sample that is still cohabitating in 1997 but the offspring are aged between 12 and 18. So the likelihood of them still being part of that household in 1997 is still very high. And when we do that, I didn't have a chance to, to show that in the presentation, the results remain unchanged. So obviously the, the sample is smaller now, but it suggests that it's the this larger sample of families with those aged 12 to 32 is not in any way different from the sample of 12 to 18. So we're a bit more reassured that cohabitation helps us get closer to, to what was happening. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, Martin. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Uh, I have sort of a, a related question that I think you, you, you cannot address with that data, but I was curious about happen with the adults right because you, you you focus on children on your analysis but i was wondering to which extent these effects also translated into adults and even like some people in their 20s or 30s acquire literacy or higher educational attainment in the cities thanks to because of the forced migration thank you Right, so that's something that we can explore just descriptively. So obviously we can't explore the schooling outcome, which is our primary outcome of interest since these people have already acquired an education even prior to the war, but, but we can look at occupations as well. And we can do that descriptively. So I, I don't have the data here, but we can certainly look at, uh, you know, particularly parents who moved with children, were they also more likely to shift into services? Obviously there would be the skill constraint for them, uh, given that the majority of them would not have an education at the time they moved, but it's definitely something that we can address descriptively. Thanks. Okay, do we have an, any other questions from the panelists or the audience? Uh, a quick one, Jesus. Okay. Are you able to understand whether the siblings that you observe cohabitating in 1997 are old siblings? So if you are, so do you have information about the existence of non-co-residing non siblings? Yes, so we have, um, obviously these households can be multi-generational households. So sometimes we have offspring of the parents, but then we'll have grandchildren and the household head is going to be a, a grandfather. So we can make that distinction. If we use the, the most restrictive distinction and just focus on offspring, so siblings who are sons and daughters of the parents, again, the results are very similar to, to what I showed today. So we can make that distinction as well. Would you know if you have a brother with whom you're not living with? So are you able to see whether sibling siblings are complete or not? No. So if they're not reported in the census in 1997 as being part of the household, we cannot. So all we have is the universe of people who are living together in 1997 and who report being part of the same household. But again, that's why the cohabitation in your question was so important because if you're under 18, the probability of you being together with your family is, is higher, so. Thanks. Okay, so let me abuse my position to ask the last question. So about the last point that you mentioned here in the conclusions. Uh, so the, the, this trade-off between uh, potential education gains and potential losses uh, due to stress or psychological problems, have you looked at some of the parameters in the literature to try to, to, try to put numbers into this trade-off, even in a sort of back of the envelope calculation? We could. So again, the research on mental health and economic development is still somewhat in its infancy in economics. So we don't have a lot to, to go on in terms of, you know, how does this map into, for instance, the, the wage uh, premium, right? So if you have higher mental health, apparently, and you're an urban dweller, and you never, you were never displaced and never went through this experience during the war, you experience higher wages given a similar level of education. So, so perhaps that's something that we could explore more again, but it will depend on whether we have any credible estimates of how to interpret this, um, this shock to mental health or not, and how to translate it into an economically significant result. Thanks a lot, uh, a really interesting uh, presentation and thanks to all of you for attending and for, for the, the questions and the discussions. And I hope to see you back next week when we have uh, Simone, do you want to preview our next seminar?
So the next seminar will be by Christina Gatman from Lizer, one of our organizing institutions. I hope to see you online on April 21st. Okay, so see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.